So, uh, from this class onwards, for many, many classes, we'll talk about many uh, proteins. Okay, the so proteins, their uh, structure, uh, uh, function, and other related things. So, as I mentioned in the last class, So as I mentioned in the last class, so, so proteins have uh, consists of 20 naturally occurring uh, L-type amino acids. Okay, so uh, these amino acids by themselves uh, have basically amino group, amine group, and carboxylic acid. Okay, so these are the two main functional groups which are present in every amino acid. So typically amino acids by themselves are triamine under the physiological condition. That's uh, pH 7.4. So where actually amine is used, amine is protonated and carboxylic acid is deprotonated, as uh, shown in the slide. Okay, and, and uh, so they have large dipole moments because you have positive charge and negative. But however, when they are connected uh, through uh, polypeptide chain, so then you have only ends, end amino acids. End amino acid is protonated and the C amino acid is deprotonated. So you don't have this feature because they are connected to the peptide bond. So vitronic character is lost in the polypeptide, uh, except at the uh, ends of the terminal. And uh, so, uh, so these amino acids have the structure of. So this is the connecting group. So where R is uh, uh, the functional group, this is actually changes from one amino acid to another amino acid. So otherwise, any H one C O H is very common. Okay. And so this R actually makes these amino acids unique okay and uh, uh, different from each other so which provide mainly the uh, characteristics of proteins okay and this r can have uh, uh, many different chemical properties okay so uh, they can be hydrophilic hydrophobic polar non-polar and uh, uh, so different orders. So if you see this table again, so uh, R, these are 20 amino acids and side chains R is actually marked uh, in pink, okay? So you can actually segregate into different groups, either based on polar, non-polar, or aromatic, uh, based on the charge, okay, or based on some other form. So uh, in the Jewitrianic form, like I said, so you have carboxylic group and amino group. So more or less the PKA uh, acid-based properties of this uh, side chains are fixed. More or less carboxylic acid is around two. So and uh, amino group is at about ten. So that is uh, the physiological conditions. You have uh, CO minus and C plus. But if you look at uh, carefully the R group, okay, certain side chains have can either donate a proton or accept a proton, so that they have acid base equity under physiological conditions, okay? So based on their PK, okay? You see which amino acids have actually this property. Uh, so cysteine, which has a side chain of uh, SH, okay, which is in uh, polar uncharged R groups. So which can actually uh, donate a proton so that it becomes uh, S minus, Okay, so the pK is 8.4. So at the physiological pH of 7.4, so it is mostly uh, protonated or deprotonated. Okay, anyone wants to tell? So cysteine's pK is 8.4 and physiological pH is 7.4. So at 
Will it be protonated or deprotonated? Will it be SH or S minus? SH. 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 Okay. SH. So let's say it needs to uh, give proton or become, let's say, S minus, okay, to become to nucleophile. So what will be the pH? It's a pH or pK, sir. Uh, no, pK is a, its property. pK is fixed, 8.4. So at what pH? So this SH becomes S minus. Probably greater than eight point four. Yeah. So about eight point four. Okay. So now if you take another side chain, tyrosine, which is aromatic. So the side chain is CH two, C six, H four, OH. Okay. So this OH can actually donate the proton, so it can become uh, the uh, C6H4O minus. Okay, so its pK is 10.5. So again, mostly at physiological pH it's good. And aspartic acid is 3.9. So at physiological pH it's actually CO minus. Aspartic acid is in uh, positively charged. Where is the aspartic acid? Uh, yeah, negatively charged R group. So CH2CO minus at physiological pH. And glutamic acid CH2, CH2, CO minus. So, so these are the important. And lysine, okay, which is positive, uh, you have, yeah. So lysine is positively charged and it gives the condition. So CH2, 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 plus. And arginine is also positively charged. And histidine, okay, histidine, which is in, uh, uh, where is this? In this uh, in this case, in polar charge group, so it is actually cyclic side chain. So it has two nitrogens in the ring. So this one of the nitrogen uh, has proton. Okay, so which can actually uh, donate uh, proton above six. So uh, in this sense, so the histidine is actually amino acids whose pK is very close to seven point four, and these pK values which are given in the table. Okay. Are only approximate, but the true pKa value of these side chains would truly depend on the environment of these side chains in the proteins. Okay, so these are not very rigid values. Okay, so that will change. Uh, so hence, uh, histidine typically send, uh, serves as a pH sensor. Okay, in proteins where, uh, let's say, uh, there is a pH dependent problem. Okay, so histidine is truly Sensors, pH uh, sensors. So, because that uh, is its pK is very close to physiological pH. And again, so, it's 8.4. Okay, so very close to physiological uh, pH. It's supposed to be protonated, but again, depending on the environment, it can have a minus character so that it can actually act as a nucleophile and which can lead to other uh, reactions. Okay. So this is uh, uh, basically the kind of uh, side chain properties. And again, sometimes you know you wonder uh, uh, when they make classifications. You know, so again, it's not very rigid. So like phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan are put it in aromatic groups. Okay, but then you can actually ask uh, histidine. Okay, uh, histidine is also uh, aromatic, right? Okay, is histidine side chain is aromatic? So this side chain is the uh, okay. So we have uh, okay. So we have two nitrogens. Okay. So we have okay, so the Okay, so is this is it side chain? Is it aromatic or not? It's an aromatic side chain. Give me doesn't prove it's aromatic. Uh, how do you define aromatic? Six pi electron in a plane. Sir, here the me doesn't group is aromatic in me, sir. No, that's correct, but there must be properties by which actually you conclude that uh, it's aromatic. Six, six pi electron in a circular plane, in a in a ring plane. Okay, four. Plus two, okay, so then six 
the atoms, what are the properties in a plane? So all atoms need to be in plane, right? Yes, sir. All of them. All right. So these are a couple of properties of the atoms. Okay. So if you see the classification here, they put it in positively charged groups, but it, 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 you can as well place it in aromatic uh, group because it's in aromatic. So in that sense, it's only one way of classification. So some uh, amino acids actually fit into uh, multiple uh, subgroups. Okay. Uh, but you don't have to really truly worry about that. Okay. So, so based on these 20 amino acids as building blocks, you can actually uh, make protein molecules. Okay. So by combining, uh, so by combining simple, uh, okay, polypropylene. Uh, sir, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sir, it is a, a bit uh, sidetracked. Uh, because uh, I am uh, asking about the isoelectric point. So uh, when we think about isoelectric point uh, for, uh, let's say, amino acid, which have only one carboxylic group and one amine group. Okay. Uh, so in that case, uh, we can actually calculate how to find out the isoelectric point. Uh, it's the, uh, the pH becomes equal to pKa1 plus pKa2 by 2. But when we have three uh, such things, I mean, two carboxylic and one amine, or two amine and one carboxylic, in that mm -hmm. case, the calculation of carboxylic acid, uh, I mean, how do we calculate it? So, like I said, when there is a side chain involved, okay, so then of course you have to include its uh, pKa, yeah? okay, but if there is no side chain, so then typically, uh, <coughs> Typically, so then they are neutral mostly at uh, seven point four. Okay, so but if side chain is involved, okay, so then this table will give you only approximate isoelectric point. Okay, so if you have to, if you have to calculate. But however, if you want to isoelectric point, like I said, then exactly the environment of this side chain, okay, will come into picture. Okay. So there Not is, uh, yes, uh, structure means that so if you are talking about proteins, you know, so then it's uh, the side chains are surrounded by uh, sometimes a solvent if the side chain is completely exposed and it could be surrounded by other side chains and backbone if it is completely buried and it's intermediate uh, is if it is uh, partially exposed. That is inside a protein structure. What I'm asking is that, uh, uh, we can actually, uh, let's say we are taking a particular amino acid in aqueous medium. Yeah, only free amino acid. Okay. So in that case, we can actually theoretically calculate out by uh, using Henderson equation that yeah, uh, how. Yes. So can we do the same for uh, uh, for those acidic and basic amino acids? Yeah, so then you have three functional groups. Right? So basically, yes. what, so you have three functional groups. One. Um, Amine and original amine and carboxylic groups of uh, amino acid plus side chain um, uh, PKA. So you have now three components. Uh, so, sir, uh, if you have, then can you later send the. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I can. Yeah, okay. So, can do that. okay? okay. so uh, let's say so if you have two amino acids, okay. So let's represent R1 and R2, okay. And so let's write the neutral form. Okay. So then if you eliminate the water molecule, okay, water molecule from here. So then you will make a peptide bond. Okay, so then uh, so you have the first amino acid and H2. So then this will be CO. And then NH. So you may take a price. A pen box. So if you have uh, so now, uh, so this polypeptide is represented as R1 and R2. And this is called N terminus because this is amino terminus. Okay. 
and this is C terminus, carboxylic terminus. Okay, so, so if you have now many amino acids, so then R1, R2, R3, so on and so forth, if you have N, okay, so then you have a polypeptide of chain length N amino acids, okay. So this N amino acids now, just like in the DNA case, you represent 5 prime and P prime, okay, based on the sugar connectivity. So here you say it's basically amino terminus N and C terminus N, okay, for the protection. And uh, so this order is important. So if you don't mention NMC explicitly, then it is uh, assumed that the first amino acid is N terminus. Okay, so it's important to write the sequence so R1 to Rn is different from Rn, Rn minus one, so on and so forth, R3 up to R1. Okay, so you need to remember that. So now let's say if you have, uh, so these 20 amino acids as building blocks, and if you can actually create a polypeptide chain. Okay, so this peptide bond is from on um, ribosome. So where actually, uh, as I showed, every, uh, as mRNA is actually sliding along the ribosome, so tRNA brings the corresponding uh, amino acid, okay, with, uh, whose codon is complementary to the mRNA. And then that amino acid is actually added to the previous amino acid growing chain. And then this peptide bond actually forms on the ribosome. Okay, so one by one amino acid is actually faithfully added. So then you get a polypeptide chain. Okay, so the question is that now, so if you have a polypeptide chain, okay, so what will it be? Uh, structure. So you know the connectivity already. So every amino acid has uh, a central carbon atom called C alpha atom. C alpha atom. So C alpha atom always has one hydrogen, a functional group, and then it has its uh, uh, amino group, okay. So if it is at the end, or it is in NH of a peptide bond in growing chain, and then uh, the corresponding C uh, so carboxylic acid is actually again contributing a CO to the amide bond, okay. So the amide bond is the bridging between two uh, neighboring amino acids in the polypeptide chain. Okay, so now you see that, so this polypeptide chain has a lot of bonds, you know, so but if you see the backbone, so for example, this is called backbone, okay, so this you see uh, NH2 of the car carbon C alpha of R1, then carboxyl group NH, C, C alpha of the second amino acid, and so on and so forth. So this is actually backbone. And then you have every amino acid uh, providing function group as a side chain. So you have now backbone and side chain. Backbone and, and the side chain. Okay, so this is the nomination chain. Okay. So now if you have a long polypeptide chain. So then next question immediately comes to your mind is that you know the connectivity, which atom is connected to which other atom, but what is its three-dimensional structure, okay? Uh, if I ask you, let's say C6, L6, okay? So you write you to the, so that's basically the real uh, uh, structure, okay? And you know exactly uh, the distance between any pair of atoms because the entire geometry is known. Okay, so because of the partial that is one character and what not all that we play, you can really uh, write the exact geometry. Right? But when it comes to these polypeptide chains, because all of them are uh, most of them bonds are single bonds. So uh, C alpha N is a single bond, and C alpha to carboxylic of its own carbon is a single bond. Okay. So these single bonds will allow you to rotate this bond. But however, the peptide bond is partially double bond character. So its geometry is fixed and should be done so. Okay, so based on all these simple characteristics, the important question you would always ask is that a given polypeptide 
sequence, okay, what will be the structure. So that's actually a big problem even today. So given a polypeptide sequence, it's not always easy to uh, predict structures because of the, the prediction, we don't really know the, all the rules, okay, which uh, uh, allow these polypeptide chains uh, take the shape whatever they are. The slide I'm showing you here is basically beautifully, you see like hundreds of structures, maybe more than 100, about 200 here. So each one is actually a polypeptide chain, okay, uh, as uh, coming from a gene. So then you call it a protein because it's naturally occurring. So these proteins actually take beautiful shapes, okay. So what you represent here is a, a shape you give it to backbone, okay, and then you see that uh, you see uh, helices, you can see strands, how the helices pack with each other, uh, strands pack with each other, uh, sometimes helices and strands are actually mixed together, and vice versa, there are many different varieties. Okay, so this big field by itself, how a polypeptide chain actually gets its structure. So, but, so I have a yeah, just, just, just a minute. However, uh, so it's not that because we know now a lot of protein structures, okay, which are derived, derived from natural sequences, uh, from the naturally existing proteins from living systems. So we know more or less most of the folds, you know. So rarely we actually add any new fold, okay, to this uh, existing uh, fold set. Where, what do I mean by that is that, let's say if we find a structure of a protein uh, today, okay, which is not known till yesterday, you know, so more or less the fold by which uh, the, the way it's three dimensional connectivity is more or less uh, the present, more or less is already um, uh, uh, solved by, okay, solved earlier, it means that there's no new, new topology. So I define these terms actually as equal. Okay, uh, yes, someone had a question, someone? Yes, sir. yes, yeah. sir. So uh, my question is, uh, at first, uh, during the peptide bond formation, in aspartate, we have an extra carboxylic group. So are the enzymes, are they, uh, so do they work in a fashion that they prevent the formation of amide linkage via that carboxylate group? Yes, that's a good question. So uh, uh, I'm talking about in vivo scenario, that's basically on the ribosome, okay? So the way the amino acids are actually presented by tRNAs, okay, tRNAs, okay, uh, to be growing chain of polypeptide, okay, on ribosome in a certain fashion, where actually uh, the way it actually brought the amino group or the carboxylic group is actually fixed, okay. So in that sense, so because the way they are brought together, okay, the way uh, the amino group of uh, a new amino acid is brought to the existing polypeptide chain end of carboxylic acid. So only these two groups actually uh, combine to give you uh, a polypeptide chain. So even if it is, let's say, R2, okay, so let's say uh, CH2COOH, aspartic acid. So this does, this is, uh, sorry, sorry, okay, let's say in this case, let's take lysine, okay. So then lysine, you have four NH2s. 4CH2 plus NH2. Okay, so this NH2 is actually not uh, proximity to COOH. Okay, so in the ribosome, so that these two will not form uh, a peptide bond. Though, actually, in principle, they are actually two uh, functional groups which can combine with you polypeptide. So uh, that's because all the seminars are actually brought together. Which functional groups? are actually uh, brought in proximity to the COOH. So that's actually kind of structural problem uh, solved by uh, ribosome, okay? Uh, but the same, uh, this is a problem in vitro or in test tube, okay? So in test tube, now if you bring in, uh, you, uh, without any ribosomes, let's say, you want to just do some kind of elimination, okay? The conditions under which, so you actually just remove one water molecule. So then you have actually two possibilities. Either this group will react with COH to give you one peptide bond, or this lysine side chain can react with COH to give you this. Okay, so this is called isopeptide. Isopeptide bond, okay, and uh, which 
is possible in test tube reactions. So that's the reason why you actually protect these groups. Okay, so you protect these groups so that only this group is allowed to react. And after you synthesize all the MN acids or the polypeptide, now you release the protecting groups so that your site changes. Okay, so, but otherwise this question is actually solved by ribosomes. So ribosomes actually never really uh, make uh, uh, isolate. Okay, under so, normal conditions. One more question yeah. about the folding of the proteins. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, in our intro, uh, so Dipta sir, he uh, he uh, he actually was working on this problem that if we take a segment of the amino acid mm -hmm. and uh, uh, if we leave it free in the water. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was accounting for the folding of that segment of amino acid that whether it is folding in the same manner as it was folded in the uh, a big structure of the mm -hmm. protein from where he took it. So, uh, I, but I didn't get the answer at that point. So yeah. is it like the folding occurs in the same fashion? Yeah, so this is a million dollar question, a $64 million question, okay, which we can't really predict. Okay, so this is what is called folding, folding, folding talk. Okay, so uh, but what I'm going investigations say that okay, so there are multiple really pathways, okay, and uh, conditions are important. Okay, so uh, there is something called co translational fold folding, co translational folding. So this occurs on ribosome. Okay, so on ribosome, as you know, the polypeptide chains grow by adding one amino acid at a time. Okay, so this process is actually very slow. Protein synthesis is not very fast process because the process is very slow. Every amino acid it takes, I think, about a millisecond, if I remember correctly. So you have growing polypeptide chain. Okay, so let's say it is Rn, and residues are there, polypeptide chain. So you need another millisecond to add another one. You need another millisecond to add another one. So during this time, this already existing polypeptide chain, okay, imagines itself that, okay, I'm an independent entity, okay, I want to fold myself, okay? So that happens for about, let's say, millisecond, but another amino acid is brought together. So now the, the protein folding problem is for R n plus one, n plus one R residues. So that itself is actually different polypeptide chain than previous. Okay, but the previous polypeptide already attained some structure because based on the end residues. But now, if you have one more than n plus one residues, that itself is going to be problem. Now, imagine another amino acid comes, then you have n plus two residues. Okay, so this problem is called cold translational folding. So, this itself is actually you don't really know how it works. Okay, so people know that uh, because the growing polypeptide chain is on the ribosome. Okay. Uh, in its tunnel, but it has freedom enough, okay, so that it can actually attain certain structures. But that is different from now if you have the entire protein is synthesized and then released from ribosome, okay. So then uh, maybe it's already partially folded, only refined structure needs to be formed. But occasionally proteins actually fold up, okay. So a folded protein. Uh, its structure is not really permanent, okay? So it can actually unfold, okay? Or, or transiently, or uh, I'm looking for the word uh, spontaneous, okay? Okay, so spontaneously. Of course, the rate is very slow, but then this unfolded chain can actually get folded, okay? So this unfolded chain, or the unfolded protein, has a structure which is completely different from as it's being folded, as it's being synthesized plus protein. Okay, so that's why people sometimes who work in this field code transfer folding, they feel that that's more, more important than in vitro because this process, folding and uh, folded protein spontaneously unfolds, of course the rate is very, very low. But however, if it is unfolded, it can actually fold. Okay, so this is in vitro because this is a controlled environment. We can actually drive this system 
either this direction or this direction using either let's say chemical reactions, temperature, or pH, or some other conditions. Okay, I use actually force to actually drive this uh, equilibrium either towards this side. Okay, so like you can actually add any perturbation. You can study this. But however, post translation folding is that. Okay. To answer your question, okay. So even if you take a folded protein, if you unfold it, okay. So each time if you unfold and if you ask the question that does this unfolded chain takes exactly the same path or the same sequence of events to its slow folded state? I don't think so. Okay, that depends on many different uh, conditions. Uh, 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 first of all, it depends on the size of the protein. Imagine the larger the size, the more number of the amino acids, uh, the higher the complex pathway will get. Even if you take the shorter ones, even 20 amino acids, 10 amino acids, okay? So it's no guarantee that they will take exactly the same sequence of events to reach the four states, okay? First of all, most of the bullets might not even actually take the same four state, okay? They might uh, aggregate, okay? Or uh, sometimes they might not have a fixed structure. Okay, so there is something something called ADP. In principle, in disordered proteins, so this by itself is actually growing field. It's a very nascent field in modern biology. Okay, some proteins are parts of some proteins. We actually not able to find any well-defined structure. Okay, so in the absence of in the absence of any well-defined structure, we tend to think that okay, maybe they don't have a well-defined structure. Even if you leave them for a long, long time, you don't see that they don't crystallize. They don't give you uh, structure, NMR structure. So we tend to think that okay, maybe that's their intrinsic problem. Intrinsically, they don't want to really achieve a, a well defined structure, but the conformationally, they're actually free to attain many different conformations of the conformational freedom. So, that come under intrinsically disordered uh, proteins. So, I don't really discuss much of the things here because we are talking about the structural proteins, okay? Uh, order structure. So, because most of the proteins actually have this, even the IDs under certain conditions, they actually attain my structure. Uh, for example, in the principle gang, okay, this could be a small molecule, it could be another large protein. So, in the of those conditions, even these IDPs are actually tend to find some structure, shows that maybe the conditions are actually important. Uh, so, to answer your question, someone very simply, it's a very big question. So, we cannot really predict, okay, if uh, a given sequence of peptide or protein is given that. What is the sequence of events by which it will fold to the same structure? Okay, so it's basically context dependent, and that's a big problem by itself. So, despite that, we have the huge database of solid protein structures by like X ray and MR, and uh, slowly even that cryo AM. So, we have only database of existing structures. So, there are actually protein prediction algorithms. They take all this existing data and empirically, uh, if a new sequence is given, they say that what is the likelihood? Okay, this amino acid is in the neighborhood of this. Uh, this stitch of amino acids actually exists in this protein. Uh, so, if this stitch of amino acids exists in this protein, very likely they might take this structure. Okay, this stitch take this. Then you put together and then predict. Okay, so every other protein, uh, uh, they will make a very known protein. Okay, so he has basically used uh, uh, Rosetta. Okay, he Rosetta So by which actually he uh, predicts uh, protein structures not based on by first principles, based on by empirical data. Already you have, let's say. 30,000 structures in the PDB protein data bank. So, you know now that it, with different 30,000 different structures and their sequences, you can actually now learn a little bit about okay, if the, the sequence of amino acids is this, so this is the likely structure. So, based on that, you can actually uh, predict any new polypeptide chain or whose structure 
uh, and uh, more or less it comes to very close to this. But this is based on the empirical data. Okay, not by any first principles that okay. Uh, so I have this sequence. Okay, this amino acid comes back to this. That's the first event. This next amino acids come together. We don't have that sequence uh, of events. Okay, so uh, let's come back to composition of amino acids because that's equally important. Okay, so this is a kind of uh, guess. Okay, so you would really take into what kind of sequences will lead to what kind of Okay. So, uh, like I said, proteins are actually uh, functional molecules. Okay, so they are the uh, what process inside the cell. Uh, uh, so most of the time we talk about enzymes, but uh, uh, the proteins can be enzymes, might get life-sudden reaction, but they could be structural. Okay, so they, they provide structure to the um, cell in terms of uh, you know, molecular level and local structure. Okay, so if you see inside the nucleus. What do we have? Chromosomes, right? And DNA. And DNA and is highly negatively charged because you have negative phosphate. So now let's say, imagine if you had to pack that together in a tight nucleus. Okay? So then you have to provide a corresponding uh, complementary um, positive charge environment to make it more low. Okay? So generally you can actually pack. But without that, so then you will be. Uh, uh, Clashing all the phosphates so that they won't really want to get compressed. Okay. Uh, not only that, but then we want to have some kind of order so that we know that at a certain point of time, a certain gene needs to be expressed so that that will be available. Okay. At will so that you have a control. Okay. So cell nicely devised all these things and uh, uh, how the DNA is packed into X shape, X shape chromosomes is by again bringing in protein structures. Okay, so you might have guessed that what kind of protein uh, uh, sequences this protein should have. Obviously, DNA is negatively charged. Okay, so you need to have the surface which gives you a positive charge. So you can really think of now. So what might be the amino acids on these uh, uh, protein structures which can actually um, uh, pack this DNA? So what you see in the structure here is that uh, nucleosome means that. Uh, so, so the DNA which is shown in red, like a rope, okay, so wound around certain molecules shown as spheres here are the protein molecules called histones. There are many different types of histones. Uh, typically, they form kind of this um, cubic structure, like eight histones come together, form a cube around which, okay, so the DNA is done. So, you can really see that the surface of these histones need to be positively charged so that. Uh, you have a proper time. Okay, so that's so again. So it shows that histone proteins need to be on the surface. Also. Okay. So second thing, for example, proteins which need to be in the membrane. Okay. So for reasons uh, either they have to allow uh, uh, protons from one side to the other side, so that you have a proton gradient. Okay. So that you can actually drive uh, use this proton gradient to drive certain reactions. Or you want to allow small molecules pass from one uh, side to uh, the membrane to the other side. Or you want to, let's say, allow water molecule, ions, you can be. So then you need actually these protein machines in membranes and when they in membranes. Okay. So then what is a membrane? It's made up of lipid molecules. So these are hydrophobic. So you would now need to have amino acids which on the surface are uh, hydrophobic so that you can actually embed this protein. So what the example shown here is the purple membrane, means that this uh, helix bundle protein on the uh, outside needs to have really hydrophobic amino acids so that they solvate the lipid, uh, uh, they are solvable by the lipid uh, side chain so that they are nicely embedded uh, 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 in the membrane to do their function. So the purple membrane's function is that, so it actually absorbs light okay, through a molecule of retinol, which actually changes the conformational chain and which drive further conformational changes in the entire protein, which uh, then lets it allow uh, a proton molecule from one side to the other. Okay, so that you have a proton gradient now. So this proton gradient further will be used to do some useful work. And typically, uh, for example, in some cases, it's actually ATP synthesis, for example, in uh, mitochondria. Okay. And, so, as a uh, question, Sir, yes. in the partial membrane, how the polypeptide chain is stabilizing the 
green protein structures in as in the histone we say the negatively charged protein is stabilizing the positively charged in uh, the positive charge deep yeah in the purple membrane so what we have let's imagine the surface of the purple membrane protein on the surface you have hydrophobic charges imagine this is like a cylinder on the side of the cylinder entire surface you need to have hydrophobic uh, uh, groups for example let's say valine isoleucine okay um, alanine so these uh, are actually hydrophobic so then they are actually nicely embedded in uh, lipid okay lipid environment is hydro Oh, okay, so you okay. can't really have it's a tyrosine, uh, aspartic acid, uh, glutamic acid, uh, lysine on the on the outside of the cylinder. Okay, then of course this will not get. Better. So okay. just to give you a contrasting example in the previous one. Okay, in the previous one on the surface you would like to have positive charge advance, it's not the negative. Yes, okay. sir. Overall, okay. So we always think about the uh, overall charge. So and uh, similarly. So the purple membrane on the surface of the let's say cylinder, if you assume the structure, so then you need hydrophobic. Let's take another contrasting example: okay, collagen. Okay, so basically collagen uh, is uh, present in your connective tissues. Okay, so, uh, so where actually uh, almost okay one third of the entire protein content is made by glycine. Means that every third amino acid in collagen protein, okay, glycine. Okay, and every fourth is I think alanine, and every sixth is protein, something like that. Okay, so uh, what is shown on the picture right side is that collagen is a triple helix. You can see the picture also. So triple helix means that you have three strands of oligopatchin of collagen come together form um, coil coil part of the helix. Where actually, if you see from the top. Okay, the center of the helix is actually uh, coated with uh, nicely only glycine. So that shows that why every third amino acid needs to be glycine because in the helix, okay, in the triple helix, each helix provides one amino acid uh, to be core, and uh, so that amino acid, uh, every third amino acid actually it, it, uh, provides to this towards the center of the cylinder, and the, all of them are actually glycine because if you uh, now you can actually imagine glycine is the shortest side chain in this uh, amino acids, okay? Uh, it, because its side chain is basically have the R is nothing but just a profile, okay? So if you take any other amino acid, okay, so which is much larger, even LNA, which has series three larger than this. Now let's say imagine if you want to have a collagen, okay? But let's say you want to have instead of glycine any other amino acid. So then you have huge steric. Uh, repulsion, okay, so will not allow you a tight packing of triple helix, okay. So it shows that so every third amino acid is actually pointing towards the center in collagen, which helps that you should have a small side chain because anything larger than that's a hydrogen here. Now uh, they need to then repel from each other, then the collagen, the, the triple helix will not be packed properly. Okay, so again, I gave you three contrasting examples. How an amino acid composition in a polypeptide chain, okay, and the resulting uh, structure is very, very important. Okay, so basically, the composition is actually kind of dictated by uh, the structure it needs to really achieve. Okay, so of course, we can uh, try to think and reason for the structures where actually structures are available. If you don't know the structure, then of course we don't. Need it. Okay, so so this is actually purely amino acids. Okay, based on uh, uh, based on the peptide bond reaction, so you actually get a polypeptide chain. Okay, so purely now you know the chemistry. You don't need connect. It, okay, but sometimes you need uh, uh, non-amino acid uh, uh, components. Okay, or structures. Okay, in the proteins. Okay. So these come actually second level of uh, complexity, okay, are the second level of refinement in connectivity of okay, in connectivity of the polymer. For example, uh, this enzyme called trypsinogen, okay, yeah, histone. What is the reason that so many positively charged things are coming? No, no. So again, you have to see that when I said that the charge is only uh, so okay. So eight spheres come together. Yeah. 
so the interacting regions are not positively charged okay so if you think all eight together as let's say a cube the surface of the cube needs to be negative or positively charged but the not the interacting regions so interacting regions could be complementary charges or it could be hydrophobic okay very often uh, it's a uh, mix up together because very often these molecules are independently synthesized so you have maybe a calm both okay it could be solvent a charge charged interactions or electrostatic interaction and plus hydrophobic both but when i say that in histone uh, the overall uh, surface positive charge when all histones are held together like eight histones held together but the second question is for dna dna Why? Why is it gap around the histone? Because it's quite small, right? Hmm. Contrast is simply much higher than nuclear. Yeah. So what you need to really think is that there is something called uh, we talk about polymer physics when we discuss polymer physics. Okay. So uh, DNA is a polymer. Okay. So any polymer has, uh, if it is a random polymer, okay, let's say Gaussian polymer, so it takes random shapes. Okay. so one of the important property which you want to measure for polymers is that because these are really long so one important property you want to really say that what is end to end distance okay so for random polymers they could be collapsed end to end distance is very small but some polymers they, they don't really collapse because they can't collapse because they can't bend them so this bending modulus is an important parameter for polymer So if you see the double stranded DNA, the bending rigidity is much smaller compared to, let's say, single stranded DNA. Okay, because now we have coil coil or right handed helix, so you can actually bend. Okay, by itself. So now these histone molecules, because of the stabilizing interactions, they allow actually bend. Okay, so we call what is the persistence length? The persistence length of DNA is very, very long. Means that almost it wants to be linear. But now, because of the histones, now the stabilizing interactions. Okay, so once you wrap around them, those interactions actually make it stable. Uh, so uh, it, this molecule trypsinogen is an enzyme. Okay, so that's actually how it is synthesized. Okay, means that we have a sequence of amino acids uh, to make trypsinogen, but however, it's not functional. Okay. So let's say to make it functional, what needs to really occur is that so trypsinogen is the precursor of trypsin. Breaking a peptide near active site results in trypsin. Means that it's a long polypeptide chain. So then you break one of the peptides after it is completely synthesized, and then put together these two uh, these two strands together. Or sometimes uh, uh, sometimes you just break off uh, the other uh, peptide. Okay. So uh, again, this is another level of uh, you know, complex to bring in that proteins once they are synthesized, okay, you don't want them to perform function right away, okay. You want to store these synthesized proteins and then use them only when they are required, okay. So then you have to build in a mechanism by which so uh, these synthesized proteins are not functioning. For example, if you say The moment it's synthesized on the ribosome, it's not functional. You need to perform another. Uh, you need to have another modification. In this case, you have to break the peptide bond at a certain position. Okay, so then only it becomes uh, uh, active. Okay. So second level of complexity is that again uh, you need to bring in more functional groups. Okay, you have only twenty functional groups and then polypeptide chain, but then you want more functional. So these functional groups are typically uh, different from what's already available from the amino acids. Okay. So, for example, the phosphorylation. Okay. Means that adding a phosphate. Okay. 
Okay. So as you see, the twenty amino acids. Forget about phosphate groups. We don't even have phosphates. Okay. So, but often you see that phosphate groups actually come in to different levels in 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 cells because from ADP you have adenosine triphosphate. Okay, cellular currency which has phosphate. There are monophosphates. Okay, um, guanine monophosphate. Uh, cytosine monophosphate CMP, a uh, cyclic CMP, uh, DNA itself. Okay, so where actually phosphates actually come in hand. Okay, so now let's say if you want to add a phosphate group to a protein. Okay, so the phosphates are not really available on amino acids, but now you can actually add a phosphate group to already existing polypeptide chains. Okay, so if you take the uh, amino acid side chains of let's say serine. Zeolene or tyrosine. Okay, so what is the common thing about serine, zeolene, and tyrosine from this table? So serine, zeolene are in polar uncharged groups here, uh, left bottom, and then tyrosine is in aromatic group. Okay, so what is the common Thing you can find out, okay, between serine, threonine, and tyrosine amino acids. Hydroxyl group. Both of the hydroxyl groups. So it has a beautiful voyage group. Okay, so this voyage group now uh, can be modified by a phosphate. You can actually add a phosphate by removing this and adding a phosphate to this side. So because of this, so these three amino acids can undergo what is called a phosphorylation reaction. Of course, again, it applies by a protein called kinases. Okay, so there are many different families of kinases. Okay, so these kinases actually find these amino acids on protein surfaces and then add a phosphate. Okay. So now the proteins, okay, with and without phosphorylation have different properties. Okay, sometimes a phosphorylated protein is active or functional, does whatever it is supposed to do. Sometimes the functional group phosphate makes the protein inactive. Okay, so it could go either way. So that depends on the proteins. Okay, so kinase is actually as phosphates. So this is important, for example, for protein where actually phosphorylated protein is active. But let's say you want to keep the protein in non-functional state, okay, by adding phosphate, but removing that will make it functional, okay. So then you need proteins actually which remove phosphate, okay. So these are called phosphatases. Removes phosphates. Okay, so you can think of any function, any chemical reaction which needs to occur inside the cell. More or less, we have an enzyme or protein molecule, a combination of protein molecules which always come in handy. So, kinases uh, add phosphates, and phosphatases actually selectively remove these phosphates from the phosphorylated side chains. Okay, so that's a, another level where actually you can regulate the protein. Function by selectively modifying these surfaces. Okay. So uh, another way you can actually modify this is is uh, glycosylation. Glycosylation. Okay. Adding sugars. Okay. You can, in the previous case, you added phosphate. Now, we actually you add sugars. Okay. So, now you have again another set of enzymes. Okay. Which can actually add sugars to uh, side chains like, uh, if I remember correctly, arginine. Lysine. Okay. Etc. So you can actually modify these side chains 
by adding a sugar moiety. Okay, so now this glycosylated proteins has slightly different function because now you have the surface has a sugar moiety. So that let's say its binding partner requires a sugar moiety to detect. So then this glycosylated proteins will come. Okay. Okay, and of course, uh, some other minor uh, changes need to be occurred, for example, like hydroxylation of uh, proline, glycine, and things. Okay, so a lot of other. So, so which is very important for collagen structure. Okay, collagen is highly also uh, hydroxylated proline at a specific uh, position on the backbone. Uh, okay, so these are called so protein synthesis is called to a translation because uh, in the central dogma DNA to RNA is called transcription process, RNA to protein is called translation process. Okay. And these modifications occur after the translation. So it's called post translational. Post translational modification. Okay, often it's called PTM. Post translation modification. Okay. So, and uh, I'm giving you only a very small list of post tension modifications. Uh, so, by this is small, small uh, groups, right? Uh, phosphate, uh, sugar, voyage, etc. That's how often you can actually modify this in animal proteins. Okay. So, you can actually modify one protein with another protein. Okay. So my favorite example in this is ubiquitination. Ubiquitination, which I work in the lab. Okay. So add, adding another protein. Okay? Another protein. In this case, ubiquitin. Okay, you will put in, you will put in, I work with other proteins, but so more small, you will put in more files. Okay, so this uh, is totally different way of actually modifying proteins, but this also comes under the PTM, post transition modifications. Okay, but what are the advantages? So, the advantage is that, so if you add a small group like phosphate and uh, sugar or OH, Okay, so the change is only small. Okay, so you have a large protein, but a sugar is there. A large protein, uh, a phosphate is there. So then the surface area change or modification you brought in time, but sometimes that's smaller. But sometimes you want to change a large a surface area. Then you have to bring in moiety, which is much larger. So one of the ways that you then why not just bring another protein? So this protein makes these are really large surface area. So uh, like ubiquitin and so on. So now you have a protein X is labeled with ubiquitin. So then you have a large modified surface on the protein X, which will have a different function. Okay. Our uh, X is attached with sumo. Okay. So there are proteins now, machines, which recognize uh, sumo and then does something to protein X, okay? So uh, ubiquitin is involved in proteasomal degradation, means that selective degradation of protein molecules uh, 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 inside the cell. So, but that's through what's called polyubiquitination. Polyubiquitination. Okay, but, but if you have Mono ubiquitination. I mean, see, now this cell is complex, right? We thought of just adding one function to the phosphate sugar. Then we thought, okay, I am level, one protein molecule. But now I am talking about many chains of molecules, okay, to somehow 
add this protein X, which could be a small, but you have a long chain of small required proteins actually chain from X. Okay, so polyubiquitination is a selectivity uh, used to degrade proteins in the presence of other proteins, you know. So often if you change the condition like let's say pH or temperature, everything in the neighborhood gets affected. But if you add a tag, says that only this protein selectively needs to be removed. Okay, in the presence of a lot of other function proteins. So then you have selectively add a tag, and the tag is polyubiquitination. Otherwise, monoubiquitination doesn't take the proteins to degradation, but modifies them. Protein sometimes it activates. And sometimes um, it takes the protein to non functional state. Very similarly, sumo. And there are actually, uh, sumo is much larger family. So you have like uh, about now five sumo molecules in the cardiology. Means that now, whether you add sumo one or two or three or four or five, you actually change the function of the protein. So you see, so, uh, so how the information actually. Uh, translated from DNA are uh, okay, uh, transition. You know, so DNA just makes a copy of protein through ribosome, through mRNA and ribosome. But these proteins themselves, you can actually add this multiple ways to modify their function. Okay, so often you have to really think of uh, this non amino uh, non amino acid structures. Of this. Okay, what sir, sir. Yes. Sir, can you say, repeat the uh, role of the polyubiquitation another time? Hmm. Uh, polyubiquitation uh, is the role is that if you have a protein X, okay? Okay, so then if it is linked with polyubiquitination, which are polyubiquitin chain, so then actually this is the Okay, selective, degraded selective. Makes recycle. Degrade means that they are actually cleaved into small peptides. These peptides can be reused uh, for protein synthesis. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, what are the other ways actually you can really to, to, to modify the function? Ah, uh, you activate the proteins. Uh, one of the ways is actually metal ions. Okay. There's a huge plethora of metal ions like uh, calcium, uh, zinc. Magnesium, okay, manganese, iron, okay, cobalt, nickel, you name it. Okay, there are many transition methods, okay, um, by protein molecules to make them active, okay, for various reasons. For example, this calcium binding site, okay, so this is calcium ATP is okay, so where actually, unless the calcium is found, uh, shown in the top left. Uh, that protein doesn't really function because the active site is only after calcium is bound. Okay, uh, well known example, of course, hemoglobin. Okay, we know that the importance of uh, uh, two things in hemoglobin one is protein part, and another is non protein part. When it comes to non protein part, again, two things one, iron, Fe2, plus, as well as a huge porphyrin ring. You know, so neither porphyrin nor iron is actually coming to picture. When the hemoglobin molecule is synthesized on the ribosome, okay, so it's synthesized as a monomer, monoglobin, then four of those rings come together, then um, uh, simultaneously they find uh, uh, porphyrin rings, okay, which are synthesized separately, and then iron comes into picture to make a functional high hemoglobin, okay. So, other example at the, the top the bottom left is shown zinc fingers. So basically, let's say zinc fingers are actually an important transcription factors. Mean that uh, so they play an important role in the nucleus. So to transform information from DNA to mRNA. So during the transcription, these zinc fingers actually come and bind the DNA strands to aid uh, the transcription of DNA to mRNA. Okay. Uh, for example, like again, the metal ions are important uh, as shown in the bottom right in iron clusters where actually iron is stored okay so this protein called feridoxin okay which actually stores iron you can imagine see that how much it's actually storing so each molecule of feridoxin is actually storing four iron atoms okay how actually it's achieving it's mainly achieving through the side chains of cysteine so cysteine is actually sulfur 
So these many systems okay, cluster together and then bind iron and then store the iron and whenever it actually is required, uh, again the iron will be released. Okay, and uh, another small point is a top right is shown bioaccumulation uh, again small uh, uh, chemical molecules okay non mna acid derived uh, chemical molecule unless it's bind the protein actually doesn't really act okay so this molecule molecule again recognized by other molecules for example in this case uh, uh, um, avidin okay so selectively binds biotin there biotin so that uh, this will be there in the Okay, so this slide on the previous slide so shows that the importance of uh, modifying amino acid side chains on proteins so that you have a, a, a next level of regulating protein function, either to activate in some cases or to deactivate. Okay, so then coming back to our question uh, once we have a qualitative chain, we beautifully know that. Connectivity of every atom to every other atom. Okay, connectivity means that we know only the bond. Okay, but what we don't know is that non-covalent interactions. Okay, because there are many single bonds in this polypeptide chain, not only in the backbone, but in the side chain. So how exactly then? You know, how do we fix? Okay, so the relative position of atoms. So that brings back basically the hierarchy of protein structure, which is divided into many different levels. Okay, primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay, so primary structure is nothing but the sequence of amino acids are reconnected okay, around the back. So, uh, neighboring amino acids are actually bonded to a polypeptide, okay, uh, sorry, peptide C1H by elimination of H2O from the NH2 and COH will give you peptide. Okay, and uh, so next level of complexity are sometimes. You know, uh, so in the primary uh, structure, we talk about only covalent bonds, okay? And often in this primary structure, disulfides are actually included because the disulfides are uh, uh, covalent bonds, where actually uh, when you have two cysteine side chains. So cysteines have side chains of CH2SH. When two cysteines, okay, come in proximity, okay? Uh, uh, in the polypeptides. So, two systems actually can bump into each other and in oxidative conditions, where let's say if oxygen is available and not reducing conditions. So, then you can actually eliminate these hydrogens and they form a beautiful uh, disulfide. Okay, so system so provides. Uh, SH, okay, uh, SH is the one, but when two systems come together, so this alphas are actually formed. Okay, so this provides a covalent linkage, okay, and uh, uh, beautifully exemplified here is on antibodies, okay. So we talk about, uh, we know now more about antibodies and talk, uh, for example, like COVID situation. So this in this antibody, we have actually four peptide molecules actually come together to give you this antibody structure. Okay, so in this one of the ways by which they are actually linked together is actually types of Okay. Okay, because this is the only linkage, okay, covalent linkage, okay, other of course non covalent linkage. Okay, so it's a lot of uh, disulfide bonds. And there is this protein called albumin, which is actually circulating in your serum, okay, has as many as 17 disulfide bonds. That's a huge number, you know, and uh, you can really think of now if there are 17 disulfide bonds, okay, so let's say to begin with, the protein begins its life as a cysteine, not as a disulfide. Only after the protein is synthesized, with these cysteines bump into each other on disulfide. Now, if you imagine 17 disulfide bonds, means that at least 34 cysteines this molecule has. So, out of these 34 cysteines, they have to be formed the right disulfides. Okay? If the disulfide bonds are not right, then the protein will 
not have the right structure and it might not even be functional. Okay. Uh, you see in the antibodies. Sir, can so, I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Can I ask a so, yes. uh, sir, so what is the efficiency of this disulfide bond formation in system in contrast to forming a peptide bond between two system molecules? Forming a peptide bond between two systems? Yeah, so, so before class I asked you, so you told that it is possible that a peptide bond can be formed between two or similar uh, amino acids. So I am asking that what is the efficiency of this disulfide bond formation over that peptide bond formation in this case? Okay, so efficiency you are talking about, okay, so I can argue that. So this is in, uh, uh, see peptide bond you need enzymes, okay? So you need enzymes uh, which catalyze selectively and remove water molecules. Okay, but cysteines, you don't need any specific enzymes, okay, for the disulfide bond formation. Uh, what I mentioned that oxidative conditions, you know, ambient oxygen actually really good enough that to make a disulfide bond, okay. So, because these cysteines, their pK is about 8.4 average, but again, that, that varies their environment, uh, where they are. And typically, you always have an equilibrium of S minus and SH. So this S minus can actually act as a nucleophile, and then one S minus can actually attack another S minus. So this uh, during this nucleophile attack, you can actually form the disulfide. So these bonds are actually much more efficient than uh, amino acid uh, peptide bond because peptide bonds actually require an enzyme. So disulfide bonds you don't require an enzyme, but you need basically oxidative conditions. Okay, but if you have reducing conditions. You can actually break this disulfide. Okay, imagine if there is another nuclear point. Okay, so uh, another nuclear point can actually attack and then you can actually break the disulfide bond. So then cysteines actually get separate. So this is very efficient bond formation and uh, the stability only mostly relies on whether you have oxidative conditions or reducing conditions. Antibodies. Okay, so they are in. Basically, extracellular. Okay, so by the way, intracellular is actually used reducing environment. So, disulfide bonds do not really form a stable, even if they are formed, they are not stable inside cells. And typically, they are stable outside the cells or on the cell surface. So, antibodies, actually, which are actually floating in the cell, so that's basically extracellular outside the cells. Okay, where the serum you have a lot of oxygen, right? Because your blood is carried. So that oxygen actually can really help to keep these disulfide bonds in the oxidized form or doing the disulfide. Okay, quickly another kind of bonds is like sometimes rarely you can have lysine, lysine side chains. They can actually form these kind of reactions where you can have uh, uh, covalent bonds which are kind of permanent, you know, so like an elastin, collagen, cyprin. These are elastic proteins or connective tissue. So this tissue actually is there for a long, long time. And this is very rigid. Is one of the reasons is that these kind of covalent bonds are formed between the uh, between protein side chains. For example, lysine and lysine. Okay, you can really think of this. What kind of this reaction? Okay, so this is a kind of uh, kind of order of convergence. Okay, so you can really think of how NH3 from lysine will give rise to kind of condensation. Okay. So, uh, so that's basically primary structure. There's nothing really uh, theory about primary structure, the sequence of amino acids, how they are connected, what are the covalent bonds, and often sometimes the subway bonds considered as primary structure. Okay. But the complication actually starts uh, when you think about secondary structure. Okay. So what is secondary structure? So secondary structure, now you begin to think how these uh, uh, side chains, okay, which are coding on the side, and the backbone, okay, what is the flexibility of the backbone? Okay, so what are the, uh, because you have seen uh, single bonds, C alpha N and C alpha C are single bonds for every amino acid. So every amino acid is actually two uh, single bonds rotation. And then peptide bond, I'll show you kind of rigid, it doesn't allow you to rotation, okay. So every amino acid is actually two uh, uh, freely rotating single bonds along the backbone. And of course, side chain, depending on how big is a side chain, you might have more um, than one uh, rotations possible. Okay, so all these actually now will bring in that 
So how do you actually then fix these rotations? Okay, so what is the angle at which actually you uh, fix it so that uh, you can really talk about a three-dimensional structure? Okay. So proteins tend to have uh, uh, kind of well-defined again, bit well-defined secondary structure, and uh, most of the time these uh, secondary structures are on either alpha helices or beta shape, and sometimes random. Okay, so then how do you define? Okay, these helices now, oh, the moment we say helices, they can be right hand or left hand. And then beta sheets, their name says that they're kind of sheet forming structure. Okay, so now we dwell into, um, into uh, secondary structure. Okay, so today I'll just talk about only alpha helix, and then next class we'll take about uh, uh, other structures. Okay, so what is alpha helix? Okay, so as the name suggests, we say helical structure. Okay, formed by the quality function, right? Okay, so uh, then we need to get into uh, structural details. So, uh, so the first property of uh, secondary structure. Okay, so we have to write a quick polygon type structure. Okay, so C alpha is basically the central carbon, and then you have uh, if it is n terminus, you have an H2. So then you have, uh, let's say I'm not really writing the uh, that book, H1, and then you have C double bond O, and then you have H. Okay, so I'll write now. Then we have it's aluminium. Then we have N Okay, so that's uh, your first amino acid, second amino acid, third amino acid, fourth amino acid. Okay, so in the alpha helix, so the connectivity is hydrogen bonding. Okay, so where So I plus four, four amino acid, I donate say hydrogen to I. Okay. So now let's say it is uh, okay, I two I plus four. I two I plus four. Let, let's see how much. Okay, so let's if I is uh, one. Okay, so if I is one, then I plus four is so I plus four is five, right? So fifth and last, okay. One, two, three, four. Okay, so sorry, one more I have to write. So C O N H and then C alpha. So then C O X. Okay, so this is R five. Okay. So we have then five as an acid. Okay, so now then I call this I I plus one I plus two I plus three I plus four. Okay, so in the R minus, so I plus four residue. Donate say hydrogen, okay, to an electronegative atom on I. Okay, so I plus four. Okay, so, so this is the residue. This, okay, so which group can actually donate a hydrogen for hydrogen bond formation? Okay, I plus 
5 has C alpha, then it has a proton attached to C alpha, then R5. So this one is irrespective of what is R5. Okay, it's not nothing to do with R5. R5 can be anything. Okay, so R5. So then you have NH and then you have CO. So which okay, which functional group can actually donate hydrogen so that it can actually donor? Amide. Amide. NH. NH. Okay, so basically this hydrogen. Okay, acts as a donor. Okay, so then to the I, so I have the uh, okay, so we are talking this is in uh, Italianus, but otherwise this will be locked in man and some okay, somewhere in the back. Okay, so now the functional groups here on C I are again C alpha. Uh, hydrogen attached to C alpha, then you have CO and an NH and R1. So, irrespective of R1, there needs to be a hydrogen acceptor. So, which one can accept hydrogen donated by uh, the NH of R1? So the carbonyl group. Which group can do it? The carbonyl group. The carbonyl group. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, this is the central plane. And this is the same Okay, so there is a hydrogen bond now between carbonyl group, carbonyl group, and uh, this. Okay, so that, that is the hydrogen bond between NH and CO. Okay, can anyone tell me? If I walk along the back door from the hydrogen to CO, how many atoms are there? Can someone count and tell me? Nine in between nine. Nine. In among the amide and the CO, there are nine atoms. Nine, nine. Okay. Which atoms are actually are really good? Uh, okay, so we have to walk along the backbone. Okay, along the backbone from hydrogen to oxygen. How many atoms are there? Including hydrogen and oxygen. And it will be 11. 11. Okay. Two people said 11. Someone said actually even 9 before I think. Thirteen, I think. Thirteen. Thirteen. Uh, yes, someone says eleven. Someone thirteen. Someone nine. Eleven. Thirteen. Yeah, thirteen. Okay. How many says nine? Post everyone in the chat. Okay, all the students just post in the chat. Individually. Okay. Arijit uh, says 13, Ankur says 13, someone says 13. Everyone is now going for 13. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sanjeev says 13. Amran Jyoti says 13. Ashwarika, 13. Anyone else? Someone said 9 and 11. So for so 9, we will count CO and NH. Yeah. Okay. You did not count. Okay. Okay. So obviously by popular choice, choice 13. So we have to fit 13. <laughs> so uh, either I'll start, okay, I'll start at oxygen. Okay. So that's one. Okay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, including. Hydrogen and thirty. Beautiful. Okay. Of five feet, your thirty feet to that. Okay. So the reason for this, okay, is called sometimes the label of helix is three point six thirty helix. 
okay it is called alarm so 30 is basically the number of atoms which are actually involved okay including the hydrogen bond hydrogen and the except okay so what is the uh, value of 3.6 okay so it is a helix now okay so now you have to really think that uh, so i just go to i and similarly uh, you have to think if it is the helix continuous uh, continuous then a plus phi to what okay i plus one i plus six to i plus two okay and i plus seven is equal to i plus three so on and so forth the helix continuous okay so all these now if you put together okay and then uh, obviously what is the meaning of hydrogen bonding so you have to really bring those two atoms of the distance to which the hydrogen bond okay so typically uh an ion from a uh, one and a half ions okay or less than about two ions okay so if the helix continues then i2 i plus 4 then i plus 1 to i plus 5 i plus 2 to i plus 6 i plus 3 to i plus 7 means that this oxygen okay uh, so we talked about okay carbonyl on the one now the carbonyl on the i plus 1 okay will be bonded to which nitrogen uh, proton what is the residue number okay so this oxygen this oxygen is now bonded to i plus four amino group so this oxygen is bonded to i plus five yes, nitrogen to i plus five and this hydrogen i plus six, six i plus six I plus and similarly this one. I plus seven. Okay. So now you can really think that how exactly this hydrogen bond and this hydrogen bond is. Okay. So for every hydrogen bond, you have 13 atoms. Okay. So depending on how many hydrogen bonds, you have those many hydrogen bonds in the helix. Okay. So uh, what is the significance of 3.6? So 3.6 comes from the uh, pitch as well as the number of residues. Let me show you again. Okay. So, so now in a simplified picture shown here, so if you see. Uh, there are uh, for uh, this is alpha helix is a right hand means that as you propagate from the n terminus to c terminus the pitch is in the right direction okay so as you move from let's say first terminus to let's say tenth terminus the direction along which the backbone goes is right handed so as uh, uh, as you move along the backbone, okay. So how much rays in the pitch for every amino acid is a rays, okay, uh, rays per uh, acid. Is one point five angstroms, okay. So each amino acid raises a cylinder, okay. By 1.5 angstrom. Okay. And so, and again along the cylinder. Okay. So, what is the length to complete one complete rotation? Okay. So, one complete rotation. rotation along the axis is 5.4 angstroms. Okay, means that if you cut cylinder of length 5.4 angstroms, you have actually complete turn on the cylinder. Okay, that's the length. Okay, so each amino acid 
raises 1.5 4 angstrom and the complete rotation of pitch okay is 5.4 angstrom so how many mn axis actually contribute to 5.4 angstrom okay so you can actually divide 5.4 by 1.5 then you get 2.6 residues okay as a pitch with the 3.6 residues exactly complete one third of the case okay so that's where plus 3.6 came so 3.6 residues complete one turn and then 13 atoms are actually involved in the hydrogen bond okay so hydrogen bond is the stabilizing factor in this alpha helix so if you see uh, the alpha helix again so all the side chains. So we talked about only the backbone. We didn't really bring any specificity of the side chains. Okay. So R1, R2, R3, R4, we left as it is. Okay. Without even worrying what the side chains. Okay. So these side chains are actually on the outside of the helix. Okay. They are not inside of the helix. Okay. So these side chains are outside and they are not interacting with each other. Okay. Unless if their two side chains are really long, you know, let's say both are lysines, then they can actually bump into each other. Of course, they are going to repel, but they can really bump into each other. But if they are very short, like lysine and alanine, there is no way they can actually interact. So the side chains are completely exposed also. Okay. And the helix is stabilized purely by the backbone hydrogen bond. Okay. That's very, very important. Okay, purely by backbone hydrogen So that's why we don't have to be thinking in the specific. Now you can imagine if you have a helix and if your side chains are hanging outside all, okay. And imagine if you bring a couple of helices together, okay, if they form a bundle, and then surface of this last cylinder, if you have hydrophobic residues that actually forms your purple membrane, for example. Okay, so in this membrane, you see that each individual helix, okay, it is alpha helix. And then now you can actually imagine all the side chains are actually outside, but within the helix, there is a hydrogen bond within it. Okay, these side chains outside now interact with whatever is available. Okay, so it could be partly with the other alpha helix, are partly the surface of the uh, membrane. Okay, so the residues which are aligned, okay, interacting with the lipids are hydrophobic. The amino acids which are actually interacting with the uh, other helix can be hydrophobic, hydrophobic, can be polar, polar, or electrostatic. Okay, if it is electrostatic, then you want a complement, positive negative. Okay. So that's basically the story of uh, alpha helix. So I'll stop here. So there are a lot of cartoon structures here. You know, you can really think of uh, different ways of representation. But what I like is that everyone should really practice this. Okay, so this is basically 13. Okay, so how exactly it is 13? Uh, let's say, uh, let's say if you put randomly one amino mean, acid is I. Okay, where is your I plus four which is going to be? Whether uh, I is the hydrogen donor or I plus four hydrogen donor? Okay, this is very, very important. Okay, it's not the vice versa. Okay, so you can't really have, let's say, hydrogen because this also has a donor. Okay, and this also has acceptor. So it's not that uh, CO is bonded to this. This is very, very, very important because this is a connectivity actually brings so this carbonyl and that. Uh, uh, NH, but not that CO and this NH. Okay, this is very, very important. Uh, as a student, and you want to be in practice. Okay, so that will explain. Uh, then we actually will remember what is 3.6 13 helix. Okay, because next class we are going to talk about this 310 helix. There is a 5 helix. Okay, then of course we'll go to um, uh, we'll go to beta sheets and so on and so forth. Okay, but this is very, very important. Okay. So we'll continue next class. So Wednesday I have a meeting to attend. So Wednesday there won't be any class. Uh, next class will be on coming uh, Friday. Okay. Yes. So
the class here and then we'll take if you have any questions. Sir? Yes. Sir, in the 13, uh, when are we counting the 13 atoms, so why not we count the backbone hydrogen of the carbon? No, no, I'm just talking about, see, I mean, they are hanging, right? So I want directly to connect to atoms. You know, so, so O, C to connect it, right? C and connected, NH connected, but this H is nothing to do with the backbone. So I'm walking along the backbone. Okay, I didn't really touch. There is a hydrogen here, I didn't touch. There is a hydrogen here, I didn't touch. There is R2 here, I didn't touch. Okay, so again, there is O, I didn't really touch. So I was actually walking along only the backbone. Okay, what is the least number of atoms along which you can actually connect covalently? This oxygen to that hydrogen. That's all. Okay. Okay. Answer one more question, sir. Yeah. When we uh, unfolded a protein molecules and the, like uh, and then the folded proteins can be uh, uh, sorry when we uh, when an oligonucleotide or when its primary structure of protein is formed, then if when it started uh, folding, if we can can we freeze the uh, folding of the protein? Like, I didn't quite follow your question. So, that if when a protein a primary structure of protein started folding, okay. so it can we uh, freeze the folding and uh, like uh, it started and after some time we fold or we freeze and then after some time we again start to freeze uh, and freeze. Uh, this, then the protein can form its previous structure or it fold in another way. No, I didn't quite follow the question, but if I understand correctly. So let's say once protein is synthesized, the backbone connectivity or the primary sequence is complete. Okay. So then, for example, let's say if it needs to form alpha helix. Okay. So then you know that these two atoms, this carbonyl oxygen, needs to be brought proximity to NH. Okay. And simultaneously, this oxygen to I plus three. Uh, this oxygen to like the six NH. Okay, so this sequence of events. Okay, so how exactly which bond you rotate such that these two atoms are actually brought together is a question of protein folding. Okay, so finally we know that, for example, this given sequence forms alpha helix. Means once it is formed alpha helix, we know that connected. But how these atoms are actually brought together? Okay, is it purely random? Okay, so it looks like purely by random choice is not going to work. So we talk about including coding classes. There is something called living cell paradox. Purely by sampling all possible combinations. Okay, so let's say we have a single bond here, we have a single bond here, we have a single bond here, we have a single bond here. Means that these bonds along which you can actually rotate to some extent. Now imagine if you have 13 atoms, okay, in between how many single bonds? I can count one, two, okay, so three, four, five, six, seven, eight bonds. Eight single bonds, you need to rotate, along which you need to rotate this polymer line to bring an interesting bond. So each bond to what extent to rotate, okay? So if it is purely by random, it's going to take infinite amount of time, much longer than the age of the universe. But every rotation followed by certain other restricted rotation, then every successive iteration will actually bring these two close to together. Okay, so this is what actually people simulate in one of the Okay, so these are called productive rotations. Okay, so if rotations are productive, then you don't have to really sample every rotation, let's say 360 degrees. Okay, so but how exactly this sequence really occurs is a big question. That's what I'm telling you. 64 million dollar question that we don't really know. But yet we know that it's not everything is random. If everything is random, of course, the protein structure would really not ever. But it looks like in millisecond to sometimes microsecond to millisecond to seconds, protein actually fold beautifully in most of the cases. Okay, millisecond to microsecond. How exactly it's achieved, we don't really know. So it looks like there is a little bit of randomness. Okay, I talked about all these details in protein folding class. There is something called hydrophobic collapse. 
So you bring actually all hydrophobic elements together because which is very easy, like oil and water. So if you put oil in water, okay, so few drops, so they might be scattered, but the moment one oil drop finds another oil drop, they clump together. If this oil drop finds another small oil drop in water, they clump together. So this is called hydrophobic collapse. So it looks like that's one of the primary driving force for coding coding, where the specificity in our R spring, okay? So most of the R groups which are actually hydrophobic tend to clump together so that you restrict now what are the possible rotations you might allow, okay? So this is basically a primary driving force, hydrophobic collapse. And then you fine tune, okay? The fine tuning is to these rotations and then correcting your hydrogen bonds to form helices, then bring helices together, they form a bundle, and then fine tuning will give you what is called three dimensional structure. So we are not even there, three dimensional structure. So when it comes to three dimensional structure, then I combine together. Okay. So there is no uh, simple way to just to say that uh, this is a sequence of events for a given coding sequence that you attain uh, the folded structure. You know. Okay, I think my laptop is charged. So, uh, sir, I have a question. Yeah. Sir, from the last class, we are dealing with central dogma. So, when the DNA was produced, uh, producing mRNA through the transcription, so how the transcription factor recognizes the initiation initiation part of the DNA from where the mRNA start the formation occurs? So yeah. So there are certain rules, okay? So DNA sequence, what we talked about, only the part which is actually copied into mRNA yes, and then pre-mRNA, mature mRNA, right? But yes. we have to start on this long, single, double-stranded chromosome, okay? Yes, sir. Is an important question. You can't randomly start somewhere, okay? So there are uh, structures within our DNA before the coding regions of DNA. So these regions are important as recognition elements for transcription factors, okay? So mainly the translation occurs by RNA polymerase, translates DNA to mRNA. But to bring in that RNA polymerase to that position, you need to assemble other machinery. That machinery detects these coding, these regions which are before the coding region, bind, then they recruit RNA polymerase, and then from that point onward, RNA polymerase actually copies. So once, of course, mRNA is copied, then directly uh, spliceosome will come and trans exons are excised. Finally, you have mRNA, uh, messenger mRNA, which actually bind that way. Okay? So these, these factors, for example, like one of the examples I showed you, uh, the zinc finger protein okay, is a transcription factor. So which actually bind certain regions on DNA and then stable complex it forms, then it brings RNA polymerase, it binds to the gene protein as well as DNA, binds tightly onto the double stranded RNA, the double stranded DNA, and then begin to copy, okay, uh, base by base, so that mRNA is actually produced. Okay, any other Question. Sir, sir, when the uh, transcription factor recognizes some part of the DNA, then the DNA still have the double helix structure. The transcription is not started yet. So that recognition is occurring from the surface of the DNA side, like from major groups or minor groups. Exactly. Recognition. Yes, 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 yes. So obviously it's, it's basically, uh, it's recognized by the DNA sequences. These are non-coding. Okay. For example, there is something called Tata box. Okay, TATA. Okay, okay, so this element is important, one of the important elements uh, which acts as a transcription initiator. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, so that is detected by a complex. Uh, it binds first, of course, uh, double stranded DNA. Then it needs to cleave, separate the stands. Then RNA polymerase binds onto one and then moves along. along. So once the initiation occurs, uh, then I think Tata box also actually maybe moves, but certain elements actually do move along the single stranded DNA. 
and then uh, again there is something stop somewhere it needs to come off okay okay sir okay, okay. so all these are actually nitty gritties are not often uh, done by single players there are multiple players are actually involved there are checkpoints there are some processes correct or not okay uh, how long the process should occur okay so built into uh, these proteins you know so there are multiple players for almost um, most of this complex, complex uh, uh, processes okay which uh, initiate and then uh, function in a coordinated manner okay after and actually we highlight only the central key outcome but to get that outcome we have a lot of other players okay these are like background players which are actually important okay okay, sir. okay yeah. sir. but if we begin to go into those kind of details then of course every process itself is a big science you know we can really have hundreds of papers you know trying to really dig out okay if i change this function to does it work what is the binding strain okay how, how many times actually there is on and off what is the correction mechanism you can really ask this question but this is a basic course i give you basically broad general mechanisms but not too specific okay so okay. two specific okay. actually we have to go on with but broadly i talk about uh, uh, for example like alpha helix is a very generic you know so if you take any uh, helix for example like say perfume membrane pull out out of those seven helices each helix will have that hydrogen bond the Whatever. Switch off. Switch off.